Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. For the past 18 months, Ilaria Santis had found tranquility and could proudly say she felt joy. For the first time in countless years, she had taken control of her life and her abode, a significant achievement. Some of the younger folks might argue that this personal renaissance came quite late, considering she was in her late 60s. But to Ilaria, age was merely a number. Even on the cusp of 60, she felt youthful, a sentiment that grew stronger after her return to her birthplace. Memories of her childhood, when she would dart around these streets, merged with those from her days as a budding actress. And even though she now strolled these paths with the stride of an elder, her spirit remained unchanged. Her return to her childhood village was met with mixed feelings. Some scoffed, why leave the vast city where she had her own space? But what many didn't realize was that this village was an integral part of the city, often referred to as the private sector. Nestled on the fringes of a quaint provincial town, the area boasted wooden homes, barns, diverse farm animals, and personal gardens for every household. Ilaria recalled whispers about the impending demolition of this district to pave the way for a modern urban development. Such rumors filled the youth with anticipation, but the seasoned residents approached the notion with apprehension, fearing displacement. As the years drifted by, these whispers faded into oblivion. Whether it was the changing times or mere oversight by the municipal authorities, life in this unique enclave thrived. The community enjoyed the conveniences of modern living, such as clean water, gas, and regular bus services to the city's heart. Over time, people refurbished their homes, seeking comfort over the allure of confined apartments and towering city buildings. Those who had once relocated to urban centers often found themselves yearning for the familiar warmth of their hometown. The close-knit community shared a bond akin to family. Celebrations, chats, shared grievances, mutual appreciation, current events, and harmless banter were common occurrences. Another highlight was Ilaria's performances. Her love for the stage had its roots in her childhood when she'd recite verses and belt out tunes. As she matured, she dabbled in theatrical sketches and even mimicked renowned artists, much to the delight of her audience. The applause and treats she received made her heart swell with pride. Whenever she overheard conversations like, Is our beloved artist Ilaria performing today? Followed by What's a festivity without Ilaria's magic, her conviction grew stronger. Determined to etch her name in the annals of art and entertainment, she dreamt of becoming a celebrated artist, akin to those she admired on screens. Sharing this aspiration with her parents elicited chuckles, as they dismissed it as a child's fleeting fancy. You are already an artist in your own right. Why wait for the movies? You can perform here without cameras, her parents would say. Ilaria's parents were humble, compassionate, and industrious individuals. Their boundless affection for their only child meant that they received Ilaria's ambitions to become an actress with equanimity. After all, many children dream of fantastical careers. They hoped she would pursue higher education and even saved money to support her. They were aware of the challenges that lay ahead for a young girl, especially in a sprawling city, far from her roots. Yet, they had never truly fathomed she'd ardently chase a life in acting. You should aim for a practical, stable profession, her mother would counsel the older Ilaria. What's the real value of being an actress? Sure, there are a few renowned ones, but the majority barely earn a pittance performing in small settings. It's charming when you're young, but youth isn't eternal. Ilaria struggled academically. She realized that success in acting wasn't just about training. It often required influential connections or perhaps marrying into the industry. Why shouldn't fortune favor me, she pondered defiantly. She dreamt of one day gracing the screen of their local cinema. While practical careers were admirable, they demanded rigorous study in subjects like mathematics and chemistry, areas she found daunting. Acting seemed more accessible. After all, what role did chemistry play on stage? The acting world prioritized different skills. The prospect of venturing into the city, unfamiliar and daunting, made her apprehensive. City life, particularly in the artistic community, was said to be cutthroat. 
She'd heard tales and read articles about the rampant rivalry and jealousy amongst actors. The camaraderies portrayed were often a facade, masking genuine animosity. Being from a distant province, she wasn't accustomed to such dynamics. In her village, relationships were transparent. Yes, there were spats and intense neighborhood disputes, some even worthy of a novel's plot. Yet, no one ever penned these tales, perhaps to safeguard the secrets of their enclave. Many young villagers yearned to depart either for academic pursuits or a promising future. Ilaria Santis departed post-schooling and only returned almost four decades later. Contrary to expectations, her return wasn't due to misfortune. She joyously embraced her roots, choosing to live where her journey began. At 20, 60 might seem like a sunset age with limited prospects. Yet, before one knows it, that age arrives, and surprisingly, one doesn't feel that old. Life continues, contingent primarily on health. Ilaria seldom lamented about her well-being. She had no major ailments. Yes, there were the customary aches in her back, legs, and arms, expected given her age and life's journey. Climatic shifts sometimes intensified these pains. Nonetheless, it was an internal torment, a concealed secret, that weighed heavier on her heart than any physical discomfort. Had she renounced her theatrical dreams and heeded her parents' advice, her life might have charted a different course. But destiny played its part. Initially, things went smoothly. However, she had to deceive her parents. While Ilaria deeply cared for them and never intended to hurt or mislead them, this situation seemed different. She told them she'd pursue studies in agriculture, which they wholeheartedly supported. That's right, my daughter. Agriculture is, after all, the backbone of our lives. Where would we be without it? Without the hard-working rural folk, her father remarked approvingly. However, her mother had reservations. It's a good choice, primarily because it might be easier to gain admission. I assume not many apply for it. Roberto, why that look? I'm just being realistic given her academic performance. They do consider that, after all. And what does she have? A diploma with average marks. But growing up around farming, that hands-on experience is undoubtedly a positive. Ensure you highlight that during the interviews. Perhaps Ilaria might have, but her sights were set on a theater school. Discussing her prowess in cleaning stables or tending to pigs wouldn't be the ideal topic for that panel. She planned to omit such details. Fortunately, her official records listed her residence in a small outlying town, not as a villager. Passports don't typically detail the specifics of rural habitats. She was acutely aware of her slim chances. Armed with only an average high school diploma and a character reference that highlighted her active involvement in school, Ilaria was apprehensive about facing the admissions panel. Yet, she was undeterred. If one school turned her down, she'd try another and another, however many it took. Failing that, she could aim for a role as an extra in a theater or film. She'd gain exposure, network, and then, perhaps, reapply. Whether it took a year or a decade, she was determined. Then, almost miraculously, the school accepted her that very year. What precisely swayed the admissions committee remains a mystery. Was it her innate talent, her distinct appearance that defied conventional standards of beauty, or perhaps her earnestness? Could there have been a directive to prioritize applicants from rural backgrounds? If so, they found their ideal candidate in Ilaria, rooted in the countryside, unpretentious in looks, and possessing an undeniable passion for acting. Despite her unyielding belief in her acceptance, when it became reality, Ilaria was in disbelief. She kept asking, Did I make it? Was I truly accepted? Eventually, a member of the admissions committee, whom Ilaria couldn't recognize, she was too overwhelmed to differentiate students from professors, let alone genders, remarked with exasperation. If you don't calm yourself and head to your dormitory immediately, we'll revoke your acceptance. For Ilaria, home was now the dormitory where they had assigned her a bed. En route, she detoured to the post office to send her parents a succinct telegram, accepted. Overjoyed. Ilaria. 
She then entered the dormitory and, without even making her bed, collapsed into it, letting tears of joy flow freely for hours. Later, she penned a heartfelt letter to her parents, extending across three double sheets. Not that she had an abundance of news, but her elation caused her handwriting to slant haphazardly across the pages. The essence of her letter was her happiness, her gratitude towards her parents, and her hopes for their well-being. Naturally, she didn't touch upon her theater pursuits. As far as her parents were concerned, Ilaria was on the path to becoming an agronomist or something akin. Though it nodded her to deceive them, she consoled herself by thinking it was in their best interest. She imagined that, in a few years, she'd be able to send them a magazine with her face gracing its cover. Then they'd understand. Given that Ilaria was an earnest student and her affable nature endeared her to all, such a dream didn't seem too far-fetched. Her genuine happiness and contentment attracted others. People are naturally drawn to those who radiate positivity. Fortune continued to smile upon Ilaria. Before long, she found herself falling in love. Upon her arrival in the city, she wouldn't have dreamt of catching the eye of someone like David, a senior student, strikingly handsome, and widely admired. The idea that he'd notice a country girl like her was beyond her wildest fantasies. But he did. He was drawn to her, not for her beauty, but for her rustic allure, genuine innocence, and unaffected manner. Even as Ilaria strived to distance herself from her rural roots, after all, she was an aspiring actress, not just a village girl. Her parents had equipped her with funds to dress more appropriately for the city. They'd sent her off with money and promised more in the future. Influenced by her peers, she began to invest in better clothes and makeup. Yet, she couldn't shake off the feeling of being out of place. David, observing this, took it upon himself to be her mentor. Rather than expressing romantic inclinations up front, he imparted. Understand, dear, we're not on track to become engineers or teachers. We're part of the Bohemia, the spirit's aristocracy. While I recognize your rural upbringing, it's time to leave it behind. And the name Ilaria? Pardon my frankness, but it does sound a tad provincial. Hearing that stung. Even though Ilaria herself felt a tinge of embarrassment over her name, thinking it sounded too rustic, she didn't have much choice in the matter. It was the name given to her, the name written on all her documents. Yet David, seemingly eager to reinvent her, had a different name in mind. How about changing it up? Instead of Ilaria, how about Ines? The name resonated with her. It sounded elegant and distinct. Eagerly, she shared it with her dorm mates. From now on, call me Ines. Is this David's doing? One friend jested. I'm studying at the same institution as you, in case you've forgotten. What's wrong if he suggests something? Nobody is dictating terms to me. Magda, your name is Magda, but couldn't you also go by Monica? Similarly, while I'm Ilaria, I can also be Ines. What's the big deal? And so, she adopted the name Ines, no longer responding to Ilaria. David did indeed introduce her to a myriad of new experiences, from dressing more sophisticatedly to adjusting her behavior. As winter approached, Ines decided to prepare in her own way. She purchased a woolen winter coat with padding and a fur collar, topped off with a matching fur hat. Proudly, she showcased her new ensemble to David, anticipating his admiration. His response, however, wasn't quite what she expected. All you're missing now are Valenki asterisk and galoshes, he remarked. Caught off guard, she replied, why would you say that? I think the coat is rather nice. It is, indeed. You'd fit right in while waiting in a queue for groceries. But for the places we'll be frequenting. She retorted, flustered, so what do I do with all this now? He replied, you could store it and use mothballs for preservation. If you continue on your current path, you might find it useful in your 40s. But if you're serious about becoming an actress, she interjected, then what should I wear? It's bitterly cold. All right, we'll sort it out, David conceded, and true to his word, he helped her find the right attire. He was resourceful and managed to get everything. Ilaria got the trendiest jeans, an oversized sweater of peculiar cut, 
a white and long scarf, and most importantly, a fur coat. It was magnificent. Also long, trimmed with beautiful fur, and adorned with green-yellow braids. It was a miracle, not a coat. Well, it was true that it was already worn, not new, and it pinched Ilaria a little in the armpits and shoulders. No worries, you'll lose weight. You need to lose a bit, about 5 kilograms or more, it won't hurt, comforted David. When Ilaria appeared in the dormitory in this outfit, the girls gasped. One of them sarcastically remarked, I think Katerina wore this coat last winter. With David, by the way. Ilaria paid no attention to that. What did it matter who was with whom last winter? She was still studying at school last winter, living at home, and knew nothing about any David. That's one thing. And two, the girl was likely just making sarcastic remarks out of spite, or rather, out of envy. It would be strange not to envy something like this. She had, of course, sold her own clothes. She had no chest or naphthalene. She sold them at a slight loss. And what she earned, David gave back for fashionable clothes. He shouldn't have dressed her since he wasn't her husband, father, or even a lover yet. The fact that David didn't push for a deeper commitment beyond their current relationship struck her as a testament to their unique bond. She believed he truly loved her, perhaps holding on to his more profound feelings for a time after marriage, an event she felt was imminent. Although they hadn't broached the topic, they shared affectionate moments, after parties, during private screenings of international films, trips to art exhibitions, and encounters with renowned individuals. Ilaria's metamorphosis into Ines was apparent. She slimmed down, her innocence waned, and her confidence grew. She experimented with smoking, though it didn't develop into a routine habit. She also learned to appreciate wine and stronger spirits, even if they weren't to her taste. In her eyes, she had evolved into a sophisticated urbanite. David seemed content with her transformation, but her academic performance told a different story. Her grades during her first year plummeted, and her attitude occasionally bordered on insolence. That winter, as the new year dawned, Ilaria found herself deeply intertwined in David's life. Their intimate celebration, which felt tantamount to a marital bond, filled her with optimism. After all, there's a saying, as you usher in the new year, so shall you live it. She hoped this meant spending it alongside David. While there could have been many factors at play, she couldn't help but sense a shift in David's demeanor after that fateful celebration. Initially, she attributed his distance to her academic setbacks and potential challenges he faced in his studies. But as time wore on, his detachment became increasingly palpable. She was filled with anxiety. Understandably so, they had grown incredibly close, practically living as a couple. Their bond felt unbreakable, yet now he began to exclude her from his activities. His academic commitments became his priority, but she wondered, how can you call someone your beloved if you don't see them for days, even weeks at a stretch? To make matters more complicated, Ilaria noticed changes in her body. She recognized the implications and, far from being scared, was overjoyed. She believed this would cement their bond permanently. However, when she revealed the news to David, he sighed and responded, A child, really? Yes, ours. Both of us, Ilaria retorted, her voice tinged with vulnerability, casting aside her Ines persona momentarily. What's so wrong about it? Many manage studies, work, and everything else while having children. It just means we grow up, become a family. That might be the case for some, David countered, but not for free spirits like me, not for artists. Can't you see that, Ines? But we can't remain vagabonds forever. Many artists lead fulfilling lives. Based on what? Your personal experiences? Everyone's journey is unique. I've never been drawn to this so-called ordinary life. So, think about where we stand. But this involves both of us. It's our child, Ilaria said, her voice quivering. I didn't commit to any promises. Didn't propose, did I? I never mentioned wanting children either. So what expectations do you have of me? 
We shared something special, Ilaria whispered, realization dawning on her. That was a fleeting moment. I admit, I got carried away. My goal was to introduce you to a different world, to help you grow. But despite everything, you remain tied to your past. No matter where you are, you long for a simple life, a family. You desire comfort, nurturing, stability. That's not me. But what do I do now? Ilaria implored, tears streaming down her face. Do you expect me to decide for you? But if you're asking, consider termination. Likely, they'll dismiss you from the academy, but you can pursue something else. There are numerous creative fields that might suit you. But that's risky. I can't, Ilaria protested. You're not getting my point. If you're scared, seek advice. Many girls have faced this and moved on. I can't assist with that. David, I love you, Ilaria murmured through her sobs. That's for you to deal with. If I committed to everyone who confessed their love for me, I'd have a larger family than royalty. I don't lead that kind of life. Follow my advice or don't, but please, let me be. Does this mean there is nothing left between us? You're finally getting it, Ilaria. We never truly had anything. Move on. Schedule the procedure, and in time, you'll find yourself healthier, happier, and most importantly, unburdened. They had this conversation in a quaint park near the dormitory amidst the early spring rejuvenation. As nature came alive after the winter's hibernation, the forsaken, pregnant Ilaria wished she could just lay down, sleep, and never wake up. The situation seemed to point solely towards an abortion. David had somehow convinced himself she'd be expelled, and Ilaria felt out of place, even without considering her academic failures. Her impending eviction from the dormitory and the shame of returning home empty-handed weighed heavily on her. If she was alone, perhaps she could find a way, but with a child? Was she justified in bringing a life into a world when she had so little to offer? Days later, fraught with anxiety, Ilaria sought a doctor's guidance. However, she first had to schedule a consultation, forcing her to grapple with her decision once more. When she did meet the doctor, the resultant anguish far outweighed her heartbreak over David or her potential academic failure. She was told it was too late for the procedure. Feeling lost and isolated, she wondered how other girls managed similar situations. She had heard whispers about alternative measures, but where would she find them? She would have given everything she had, endured unimaginable pain just to find freedom. She might have taken desperate measures if not for the harrowing incident involving Eugenia, an older student. The university community was jolted with the news of her passing following a botched attempt at ending her pregnancy. Nothing, however, compared to the grief of Eugenia's mother, who arrived to collect her daughter's belongings. A memorial photograph was placed in the corridor. The vibrant, lively Eugenia stared back. In the aftermath, the students were addressed by their female supervisor who voiced her frustrations. What are you thinking? If not for yourselves, consider your families. Must your actions lead to such tragic ends? It's not an insurmountable issue. Get it done. Yes, it's painful, but be wiser next time. Eugenia missed her window, a friend interjected, tearfully. And the child's father? He abandoned her upon discovering he was already married. I don't care for the specifics, the supervisor snapped. I've heard countless tales like Eugenia's. Almost annually, young women face similar fates. Some outcomes are arguably worse. At 20, Eugenia now rests. Remember, sometimes they place the coffins where groundwater resides. But she won't feel that. Others aren't as fortunate. I've seen some who, in desperation, end up with lifelong impairments. One such girl, blinded by her rash actions, now navigates the world with a cane, becoming a constant reminder of the consequences of thoughtless decisions. Another young woman, about five years ago, ingested a harmful substance. It didn't just harm the unborn child, it severely damaged her intestines. Though she survived, her body was forever altered. 
They had to remove most of her intestines, and now she uses an external bag to manage her waist. Despite her youth, this is now her reality. Some situations are truly bleak, a voice quivered. Indeed, they are. Eugenia won't come back from her resting place. Another may lose her sight. Another might live with a constant reminder of her choices, with people avoiding her out of discomfort. Those are bleak realities. But a missed deadline? Just go through with the pregnancy. If you can't care for the child, there are adoption options. Leave the infant at the maternity hospital. The state will ensure its well-being. Perhaps a loving family will adopt the baby, forever grateful for the chance. Ilaria found solace elusive that night. The thought of Eugenia trapped in a submerged coffin was tormenting, yet the curator had presented a solution, go through with the birth and consider adoption. But even that prospect filled Ilaria with apprehension. How would she face society? The girl in the adjacent bed seemed to sense Ilaria's distress, whispering, Can't sleep? How about a cigarette? After they lit up, she continued, What's bothering you? The looming eviction or today's news? Everything, Ilaria admitted. I've seen it coming. David pulls this every year, and you got ensnared. What's next for you? Heading home? I can't face my family. The mere thought made Ilaria recoil. She couldn't bear to bring shame upon her parents. The dorm's going to kick you out. I've seen the list of those barred from exams. Your name tops it. How far along are you? Around four months, Ilaria guessed. Listen, I have an aunt in the housing department. I'm not sure about her exact role, but she might help you land a job that comes with accommodation. She's always prodding me to join. Currently, there's an opening. I've had enough of her nagging, so maybe you can fill that spot. She's eager to help. The job's not glamorous, it's janitorial, but they provide a service apartment. Over time, it could be yours. At least it's a place to start. Have you thought about what you'll do with the baby? I'm still unsure. What's there to consider? I've known people who have faced this, and they're fine. Of course, it's challenging, but they've managed. Are we heading to my aunt's place? It's a bit of a distance on the outskirts. Do you think they'll take me on? Why wouldn't they? You're young, don't have any habits like drinking, and you're healthy. Usually, they hire people for janitorial jobs who aren't the best fit. You'll be a welcome change. Just don't disclose the pregnancy immediately and try to conceal it as long as possible. Later on, you can clarify that you won't be taking a long maternity leave and there won't be a child to care for. A short medical leave will suffice. All right, it's worth a shot. I'm just lost about what to do. Then it's settled. We'll sort it out tomorrow. Once everything's confirmed, you can collect your documents from the educational department. And that's how Ines, a theater institute student, transformed into Ilaria the janitor. She was provided a room on the ground floor of a shared apartment. Though it was modest, it had all the necessary facilities. Her co-residents, who were also her colleagues, comprised two other janitors and a plumber. All of them had families. Ilaria mostly kept to herself, with the neighbors not prying much into her life. She was given a designated area to clean and she diligently performed her duties. For a long time, no one knew about her pregnancy. Ilaria donned loose, old clothing and limited her interactions with people. She avoided making direct eye contact and informed her parents that she wouldn't be able to visit during the holidays due to an intensive training program in a different region. However, she assured them of a visit the following year. As her due date approached, the same aunt, who was actually the housing supervisor, confronted her. Why didn't you inform me about your pregnancy? When are you planning to take maternity leave? It's only been six months, Ilaria fibbed. I can work during my maternity leave. Why should I waste time doing nothing? We'll see, replied the aunt with a stern expression. Ilaria didn't attend any prenatal classes. 
She found a maternity hospital on her own and admitted herself when she felt her labor starting. She had a relatively smooth delivery, giving birth to a healthy baby boy. The medical staff, familiar with such situations, immediately posed the question, Will you be keeping the baby? Elaria penned a letter, renouncing her parental rights to her newborn son. She declined to breastfeed him and couldn't bring herself to lay eyes on him. However, she did request that he be named Paolo, after her grandfather, her father's father. She returned home without her child, informing her neighbors that she had experienced a premature birth and that the baby hadn't made it. It was uncertain if they believed her, but none seemed compelled to probe further. And truthfully, who was genuinely concerned about Ilaria and her baby? The young woman, once marked by her effervescent, naive trust in others, was scarcely recognizable. No longer did she radiate youthful warmth. Instead, she went about with her gaze fixed downwards, focusing only on her immediate tasks, whether that was her broom brushing against the pavement or heaps of rubbish. A few residents would acknowledge her politely during her cleaning rounds. She'd reply, albeit with her eyes rooted to the ground. It felt as though everyone was privy to the secret sin she believed she bore. Most didn't even truly see her, Perhaps they pegged her as a nondescript janitor, close to forty, gaunt, and devoid of companionship. Yet, in reality, she had recently celebrated her twentieth birthday. For five years, she led this existence. Days blended seamlessly into each other, with little differentiation between one season and the next. But one thought remained incessantly present, I abandoned my own son. When she eventually returned to her parents during vacations, she refrained from weaving tales about her education. She divulged the truth about her expulsion from the institute, her subsequent employment as a janitor, and the room she had been allotted. Her parents were aghast at the life she had chosen. Oh, Ilaria, how could this be your fate? From an institute to sweeping floors? Is this fitting for someone as young, beautiful, and knowledgeable as you? Her mother's lament was palpable as she beheld her once vivacious daughter, now appearing drained and spiritless. Mom, maybe someday I'll pursue something else. For now, this is my life, and I'm managing. Upon her departure, her parents confided in one another. Roberto, something's amiss. How could our daughter remain so distraught over an expulsion that happened over a year ago? I see it too. I could never have fathomed that our Ilaria would end up in this state. She remains tight-lipped, insisting everything's all right. Who is she trying to fool? Us? It feels like she's consciously choosing this life. Perhaps, with time, she'll find her way again. Let's not dwell on it too much. Ilaria's mother held back her tears from Roberto, whose health had deteriorated significantly. Whenever he became the slightest bit agitated, he would spend the entire night in discomfort, his heart giving him trouble. On one of Ilaria's visits, after absorbing her daughter's account, her mother implored, Oh, just leave all this behind and come back home. I can see you're struggling, even if you don't want to talk about it. Here, even the walls offer solace. Come back and live a wholesome life. Who's stopping you? It would be a relief for us as well. Your father's health is worsening. Ilaria declined and returned to her life of monotony. Each day began before dawn, ensuring pathways were cleared of snow, leaves, or trash before the town stirred for work. Despite the workload, Ilaria never complained. In fact, the exhaustion became her refuge. The more fatigued she was by day's end, the quicker she'd fall asleep. Sometimes, her dreams transported her back to the days when she was a young, admired actress or the student Ines, the envy of her peers. But those dreams often ended with a boy, bearing a striking resemblance to her, questioning her from afar. Why, Mom? Why did you leave me? Over the years, Ilaria gradually began to reclaim pieces of her lost spirit. On one unanticipated occasion, the master aunt, who was aware of Ilaria's birth date, recognized she was turning 25 and decided to celebrate. Gathering the entire team of municipal workers, she gifted Ilaria a bouquet, lauding her exceptional performance and granting her a bonus. For Ilaria, this gesture was unexpected. 
Overwhelmed with emotion, she wept openly, a rarity these days. It sparked a thought, maybe she could find her son. However, the thought was immediately followed by fear. In her current state, how would he perceive her? She overheard a conversation between two women. I can't believe she's only in her mid-twenties. I assumed she was nearing retirement. She doesn't seem like someone who indulges in vices. Her appearance is of someone who's barely lived. Something must have transpired in her past, her companion guessed. Yes, something irrevocable happened. I shouldn't be alive after that event. But I must find my son to at least seek his forgiveness. However, before undertaking such a journey, she needed to address her appearance. In her current state, even a simple trip to the store garnered judgmental glances. To inquire about her son's whereabouts, she had to look respectable. Maybe he was adopted by a well-to-do family? If Pablo now saw someone else as his mother, a sophisticated, well-dressed woman, how would he react to Ilaria, the janitor in worn-out clothing? Over the years, without a specific objective, she had been saving money. Her expenditures were minimal, limited to basic groceries. Gourmet foods no longer appealed to her, and cooking was an alien concept. The only indulgence was her love for strong tea. Her parents never accepted financial help, often expressing their displeasure over any gifts that exceeded the cost of a box of chocolates. This resulted in a modest savings accumulation from her humble earnings. One day, while counting her savings, an epiphany struck. She had been saving for an eventual reunion with her son, who was nearing his sixth birthday. What if he's still living in an orphanage, waiting for his mother to come for him? I need to find out somehow. One summer day, after taking her vacation and planning to go to her parents, Ilaria made up her mind. She went to a beauty salon, bought some cosmetics, a summer dress, and tried to tidy herself up as best as she could. The neighbors noticed the change right away. Well, Ilaria, you've come alive. I'm impressed. You truly are beautiful. You have a great figure and a lovely face. Why did you go around all this time looking like a wilted old woman? Ilaria didn't go into details. She simply said that she was going to visit her family so as not to upset her mother and father. But before she went to the train station, she first went to the maternity hospital. She wasn't quite sure who to approach there. She decided to go to the head nurse, the same one who was present when she wrote the letter refusing her child. She was afraid. That middle-aged woman had been quite stern, and she remained so. She hadn't even gotten any greer. But then again, not much time had passed. Ilaria managed to get to her office, but explaining the situation was difficult. Five years ago, she gave birth and then refused. A hopeless situation. A boy, weighing 3,500 grams, named Pablo. She tried to find the right words to convey the purpose of her visit to the doctor. The doctor understood everything except the main thing, her intention. Well, okay. What do you want now? We discussed everything back then, and the refusal is final. It's too late now. You won't find out anything. How can that be? Please, Ilaria pleaded, holding back tears. What please? Can't you understand, young lady? You have no child. You refused him. Now, leave and stop interfering with our work. Who let you in here? Margot, she shouted, calling someone from the corridor. A young nurse or perhaps a secretary appeared promptly. Escort her out and don't let her in again. What kind of passageway is this? Please, Margot said with sadness, gesturing towards the door. Please leave. Ilaria didn't want to inconvenience the girl. She left and stood against the wall. Through the door, she could hear the head nurse reprimanding the young woman. Shouldn't have approached her. You should have gone to someone else, offered money perhaps. Someone must know something. The girl came out of the office, red-faced and annoyed. Why are you still here? Go away, she snapped at Ilaria. I can't just leave, Ilaria said desperately. Someone who has worked here for a long time must know something. No one. Leave. 
No one will tell you anything. You shouldn't even be here. Should I call security? Fine, I'm leaving. Goodbye, Ilaria sighed and walked towards the exit. She didn't intend to leave with nothing, though. She was sure that eventually, she would get some answers. As she approached the exit, she noticed an older woman who was also leaving, and it was apparent that she wasn't just a visitor, but a staff member. Ilaria didn't remember her, but she rushed up to her. Wait. Tell me, did you work here five years ago? Yes, I did, the woman replied, surprised. Why? I gave birth to a boy here, Pablo, and then I gave him up for adoption. Well, I remember, Pablo, named after his grandfather. So what? Thank God. Ilaria exclaimed. I don't need anything from you. I just want to know what happened to him. Was he adopted or sent to an orphanage? I can pay. Are you crazy? What will you pay me for? I'll get fired for this, disgraced, or maybe even taken to court. And you think you can pay me, huh? She muttered through her teeth without looking at Ilaria. He was adopted back then. Nice people, childless. I won't tell you anything else. I don't know anything. Now go away. And Ilaria left. She understood that nobody would tell her anything simply because no one sympathized with her. And perhaps that was right. What was there to sympathize with? Was she in a hopeless situation when she gave up her son? No, of course not. Back then, she had 150 justifications, but as soon as she put the period on that application, she realized she had none. Yet, she didn't tear up that piece of paper right there, nor did she take the child back. And now she was wandering around, begging, pestering people. But how would she face her own son now? What would she say to him? What trauma would she inflict on her own child? No, trying to explain something to him now is pointless. I won't even be able to ask for forgiveness. I have to wait until he's at least an adult. If Pablo was adopted by good people, then he must be living well. I can't offer him anything right now. I have to wait, save up more money, and then, after some time, I'll be able to do it. I'll easily get the address of his new parents, with a bribe. Do these nurses, caregivers, who else is there? The head nurse, of course, is pointless to bother, but these women, I can approach them, and they'll surely give me the address. I'll be able to see my child. That's all. For now. Well, what can I do? I'll live like this for now. As planned, Ilaria went to visit her parents. She was surprised to see how bad her father looked. Roberto had indeed aged significantly. Mama, what's wrong with Papa? Is he sick? Well, as you can see, he's sick. I'm not getting any younger either. I'm only holding on for his sake. Looks like we won't ever have grandchildren. But why do you say that, Mom? It's entirely possible that you'll have them someday. What can I do? I can't just conjure grandchildren out of thin air for you. You'll get them, charmingly. How much longer do we have to wait? Tell me, my daughter, what's going on with you? You probably had an abortion? Oh, my God, Mom, I didn't do anything, I swear. What are you making up? I'm not making anything up. In all this time, you could have given birth already. How old are you now? I'm almost 26. I understand, but if you were studying, working in a good place, it'd be different, but what have you been doing? Instead of having children, you're cleaning up garbage. Well, you know, my job is no worse than any other. Women give birth at 40. Well, then we really won't have any hope. We wanted to see you happy, my dear. And here you are, working as a janitor. Yes, I work, and people appreciate and love me. Nothing wrong with that. Why is my job bad? It's good, of course. Very good, especially for someone who wanted to be an artist, studied at the Institute. But what can I do? I didn't succeed with my studies. No, of course not. It's okay. 
I just feel sorry for you, and I feel sorry for myself. Ilaria didn't know how to comfort her mother. Her visits home didn't bring joy to anyone. Why do I even come here? I'd better stay home, not take any vacation. I would work extra hours, earn some money if I decided to save, Ilaria thought on her way back home. How everything is so bad, dear God. How everything turns out to be so absurd. Why is my life so difficult? Back home, life continued as usual. Ilaria started to take on more work. She always gladly took on odd jobs, cleaned other people's yards. Some friends would come to her. Oh, Ilaria, can you clean my stairs? I have things to do. Ilaria, will you sweep my garden? Transport the trash to the landfill? I don't have time. Sure, I'll be glad to help. Besides, some of the residents knew Ilaria well. They trusted her and asked her to wash the windows in spring, secure their houses before winter, or clean the floors, carpets, and do their laundry. There were always such jobs available. They paid, of course, peanuts, but for Ilaria, it was a joy to save even a little. At home, she had nothing to do anyway, just sleep, eat, and that was it. She had an old black and white TV a neighbor gave it to her when she bought a new color one. Out of happiness, Ilaria gave her old TV to her neighbor. She didn't particularly enjoy watching TV. There was nothing worth watching about someone else's normal life. Sometimes she would have some noise in the background, and that was enough. She often read books, but only before sleep, until she fell asleep. It wasn't of particular interest either. That's how she lived, cleaned, tidied, whitewashed trees, marking the changing seasons only by the quality of the garbage she collected. And she remembered her son's birthday firmly, but everything else seemed to have faded away, unimportant. During each visit home, her parents would urge her to stay, but they had little hope left. They said it out of habit. Ilaria understood that her mother and father were getting weaker, their health was quite shaky, but she couldn't stay. As long as she lived in the city, it seemed like her son was still close to her. Well, maybe he was living there somewhere, perhaps even on a neighboring street. Sometimes she would scrutinize the faces of boys of his age, hoping to see her Pablo. She was convinced she would recognize her son immediately if she saw him by chance, but it hadn't happened yet. Time went by, and one day, after returning from another visit home, Ilaria barely had time to unpack her suitcase and go back to work after her vacation when she received tragic news her father had passed away. She had to ask for time off again and go back to her hometown. She was going to bury her father, but her mother couldn't handle it either. Her heart couldn't bear it. She didn't even get a chance to say her final goodbye to her husband. The daughter had to say goodbye to both her parents. Ilaria, are you going to stay now? Her neighbors asked. Ilaria didn't even understand the question. Why stay now? She had nothing here. She locked up the house and left for the city, thinking that she might never return. Again, a joyless, monotonous life, a life of a workhorse. People saw that she hardly reacted to any attempts at communication, didn't try to interact with anyone, so they left her alone. Even the men at work didn't bother Ilaria. Perhaps they considered this gloomy and withdrawn person not even worth noticing. No one asked her anymore if she was planning to get married or if she had any suitors. It was evident that she had nothing. And maybe she didn't need anything. It's her happiness, not needing anything. Others, you see, walk around, suffer, and search. And what about her? She worked came home, slept, and then back to work. How can you live like that? People would gossip sometimes. Whether it was right or wrong, Ilaria lived. She wasn't a foolish woman and often thought in the evenings before going to bed how fruitless her life had been. In fact, her life had almost passed. She hadn't gained anything, and she had no one. She was entirely alone. Yes, somewhere, her son was living, but was there any hope to find him? Retirement age was approaching. Perhaps she could continue working, but would they let her? After all, the job was tough, and she herself was exhausted. But if she retired, what would she do then? 
It wasn't even about money. She had gotten used to living on a pittance. But what would she occupy herself with? The melancholy was pressing on her chest harder and harder, and she was already eager to move back to her homeland. Things were just different there, not like in the city. At least, life there felt closer, people somehow more connected, but now no one was waiting for her there either. Her parents had been gone for a long time. Their house had probably crumbled away by now. Even during their lifetime, the house barely stood, and its young owner paid it little attention. But what was there to do now? She didn't even have any close relatives left. Familiar faces? Well, those acquaintances, God forbid, would remember her. And then came that sad day when Ilaria turned 55. She had to leave her job, apply for her pension, and think about searching for her son. Yes, that's all Ilaria could think about. She counted her savings. There wasn't that much. Perhaps she could approach a private investigator. There were some, they said, but their services were likely expensive. Her savings might not be enough to find Pablo, her son, about whom she knew nothing except for his date of birth and name, and even that might have changed. Who knows what his adoptive parents decided. Meanwhile, life was getting more and more complicated. She wasn't evicted from her apartment, that tiny room in the communal living setup, but she was surviving. Her neighbors wouldn't mind having her room. So why not get rid of the lonely old woman for whom there was no one to speak up? Her neighbor's children grew up, and here was this unnecessary old lady. Ilaria Santos herself wouldn't mind leaving, but where to? And then she received a message from her native private sector a distant relative had passed away, bequeathing her house to Ilaria. She packed up and headed home with a sense of relief. There was one more important matter waiting for Ilaria Santos upon her arrival. She had to deal with the plot of land where her childhood home once stood. Not much remained of it, but the plot was there. The head of the settlement said it could be sold for a pretty good price. It was perfect timing. The money she would receive could be added to her savings, and that amount might be enough to finally find her son. Did I leave the city too early? I could have endured the neighbors. But now, what should I do? Ilaria thought as she wandered around her plot of land. In general, she didn't regret returning. It was good in their settlement. Hardly anything had changed. Well, yes, there was a new store now, called a mini market, where one could find everything anytime. But it was still a place for local gossipy women who gathered here to chat and discuss fellow citizens' lives. Only these were granddaughters and great-granddaughters of those who used to gather here during Ilaria's youth. Those who could remember her had long since passed away. Perhaps a few old women remained, but did they remember the little cheerful girl Ilaria, the aspiring artist? Her peers, also no longer young women, barely remembered Ilaria, and they had nothing in common. Ilaria Santos had become accustomed to not interacting with people, and even more so now. She had another task. She was busy arranging her home and selling the plot of land. Time flew at such an advanced age. The plot was sold by winter, and there might have been enough money, but she didn't want to travel in the cold. She decided to wait for spring. She felt so good in the house that now belonged only to her. No one quarreled with her on the other side of the wall. No drunken husband of a neighbor made a fuss. Their sons didn't misbehave and sneak into Ilaria's daughter's room. Cheeky little thieves. No one yelled behind the door. When will that witch, that vampire, die and free up the room? There were no knocks on the door in the morning or the middle of the night. Ilaria Santos was starting a new life or continuing the one that had been interrupted 40 years ago when she left. She was learning to communicate with people again, strangers who felt almost like family. She was no longer the local janitor. No one knew her, but many were interested in who was now living in the house of the late woman Elisa. Ilaria Santos gladly stopped and freely conversed with her new neighbors, telling them about her connection to the former owner and where she lived before. These conversations were not offensive, just as her responses were not shameful. Of course, she didn't talk about the main thing yet because she herself didn't know what to answer. Did she have children, grandchildren? Where were they? Who were they? I don't know about it yet. 
But I'll find out. I'll definitely find out. That's for sure. Thus, one and a half years of her new life had passed. It was time to execute her main plan. As it turned out, with money and the ability to connect with people, it wasn't all that difficult. Of course, she didn't divulge her innermost secrets to anyone. She simply struck up a conversation with a neighbor, a man she asked to fix her fence. While he worked, she found out that he was none other than the son of her former classmate, who was now deceased. She reminisced about the past for a while and then hinted that she had moved to foreign lands, losing touch with many acquaintances and relatives. But there was one person she desperately needed to find, and she didn't know how. You see, I'm an old-timer, from a bygone era. I don't know modern ways. The youth knows everything. They have these clever phones, computers, and all that stuff. I'll have to go back to the city, wander around there again. But there's no guarantee I'll find him, she said. Well, Aunt Ilaria, it's not necessary at all. I have an acquaintance in our city, a lawyer, and he can find anyone you want. Seriously. Just give him whatever information you have about the person, and he'll tell you all about them. And if you want, not just about him, but also about his ancestors, his grandparents, and great-grandparents, her neighbor convincingly stated. Is that even possible? Ilaria doubted. What's so surprising about it? You yourself said there are so many possibilities nowadays. And he not only has knowledge, but also connections. So, if you want, I'll contact him today and ask. But, you know, it will cost money. Not to me, but to him. I'll do it as a neighbor, for you. But for him, it might be more complicated, he explained. Oh, my dear. Whatever he asks, I'll pay, and I'll be forever grateful to you. Just remember, this should be between us. Don't tell others. It's a delicate matter, Ilaria said. I'm not a gossip, Aunt Ilaria. Just tell me who you're looking for and everything you know about this person. I'll write to him tonight. I don't know how long the search will take, but I don't think it will be too long, he assured her. Ilaria Santis went inside, quickly wrote down everything she knew about her own son, his name, where and when he was born. She came out and handed the paper to the man, her hand trembling. Here, Sancho, I don't know much about him, but you tell him if he can find him or not. But I'll pay either way, she said. Don't worry, Aunt Ilaria. He'll find him. He'll provide you with all the information you need. Well, maybe not as quickly as you'd like. You'll have to wait a few days, he replied. The weight weighed heavily on Ilaria. She went about her daily chores, but her eyes kept glancing towards Sancho's house, awaiting and fearing his appearance. What if he came back, waving his hands? I'm sorry, Aunt Ilaria, but I couldn't find him anywhere. There's no information about him. Or worse, what if he found out more than she wanted, and he'd throw the paper in her face, saying, So this is who you are, neighbor. You abandoned your own son, and now you're looking for him when he's already a father and almost a grandfather. But he doesn't want to know anything about you, cursed Cuckoo. There were a million possible answers to her question, and very few of them were good. What if her son had followed in his father's footsteps, and David's footsteps? Wandering the world, or sitting in prison, or perhaps suffering from some illness. But even all of that wasn't as terrifying as the one thing she refused to entertain during the day, only for it to haunt her in her sleep in vivid detail. In her dream, Sancho suddenly appeared, dressed up like he was going to a celebration, wearing a blue suit with a sparkle, a colorful tie, a cheerful smile, and joyfully said, Don't search, auntie. Your son passed away a long time ago, in infancy. She woke up in tears in the middle of the night, something she hadn't experienced in a long time, and spent the rest of the night consoling herself. They say you have to interpret dreams the opposite way, and anyway, since Sancho brought such terrible news in such a festive manner, nothing terrible will actually happen. If it's true that my son is no longer in this world, then I have no reason to live either. And all the rest. Well, it's not great, but I would still be with him, helping him in everything, accommodating him in my home, even as an adult, I would have cared for him. 
she thought. Finally, Sancho arrived. He was dressed in ordinary clothes, with a polite smile, quite restrained. Good afternoon, Aunt Ilaria. Well, I found your Pablo. And he doesn't live in the capital or anything, he lives in our city. He owns a construction company. But it's quite a significant company, known everywhere, he said. Oh, really? Is it him for sure? Elaria asked, both relieved and afraid. Sancho handed her a piece of paper. Yes, everything matches. The place and time of birth, it all lines up. And Pablo is a rare name. I've never known a single Pablo in my life. I can't give you his home address, unfortunately. It's not allowed, but the head office address is there for you. It's right in the center. All the phone numbers are listed, and there's even a cherry on top of photograph. Ilaria, barely containing her emotions, hastily paid Sancho and said goodbye to him. She wanted to be alone to examine the photograph. Apparently, he understood this and didn't linger, leaving. With tears in her eyes, she stared at her son's portrait. He looks like his father in the eyes, but otherwise, he looks like me. Pablo, my boy. But he seemed happy, at least he was wealthy, and she would have to go to the city, too. To what? Just to see your son? To confess to him? No. She didn't want that at all. It would be embarrassing and pointless. It was laughable to think that a 40-year-old accomplished man would rush into her arms, exclaiming, Mom, what a joy to have found you especially considering that another mother had raised him, the one who had given him everything, education, upbringing, love. But nobody will forbid her from seeing him, right? Even if it's just a glimpse, in secret, this completely lonely woman must see the one she gave birth to. After all, hasn't she redeemed her guilt through this solitary, difficult life, filled only with work and longing for Pablo? The next day, Ilaria Santis gathered her things and went to the city. Yes, their settlement, which city dwellers called the village, was also within the city limits, but when they planned to go to the central area, they always said, I'm going to the city. To get there, she had to take the bus, which ran quite frequently, as many villagers worked there. The journey to the center took about an hour, so it wasn't too far. Once there, it wouldn't be difficult to find the main office where Pablo probably worked at that very moment. The only question was, when would he leave work? She arrived at her son's workplace around noon. Perhaps he would go out for lunch, or maybe they had a canteen right there. The building was so splendid and modern, surely they had one. Elaria Santis walked along the building, looking at the windows. Behind one of them, and suddenly, she noticed a job posting not far from the main entrance, cleaning lady wanted. That's me. It's a good thing I have my documents with me. I'll go now, and if they accept me. Ilaria Santis hurried. She didn't want anyone else to take that position. It might be necessary for someone else too, but only for the salary. But for her. This job was her only opportunity to see her son, maybe every day. She entered the building and asked the security guard where the HR department was. She went to the indicated door. Somehow, she felt like she would immediately see her son there, but he wasn't there. Several women were sitting in a large office. Ilaria Santis approached the designated desk. The woman listened to her, scanned the documents, and shook her head doubtfully. You certainly fit the criteria, but your age, Ilaria. Won't the work be too difficult for you? And you live quite far, she said. Oh, don't worry, I've done this kind of work before, and I'm not sitting idle now. You see, my pension is small, and what else is there to do? Sell vegetables from my garden? But will people buy them anymore? Besides, I assure you, I'll manage the commute. I used to start working at 6 in the morning. We have a bus here, Ilaria reassured the manager, trying to suppress her embarrassment. She wasn't used to asking for things. She usually tried to get by without it, but this time, she probably couldn't avoid it. While she spoke, she didn't notice that the door behind her opened. A man entered and stood at a distance, listening. 
He asked the HR employee, what's the matter here? Oh, this is an applicant for the cleaning lady position. She's from a private sector and is of a certain age, the woman replied. I think that's not so important. We're not allowed to reject based on these reasons. Let's give her a probationary period. I mean, let her show us what she can do. You can see for yourself if she can handle it, he said. Of course, I'll manage, Ilaria promised, trying to control her tears, her excitement, her bitterness, and her happiness, because for the first time, she was seeing her 40-year-old son. Yes, it was Pablo. And now, Ilaria Santos could see him fully, not just as in the photograph. He resembled his father David, not only in his eyes, but also in his height and slim build. And he resembled her too, but not how she looked today, or even when she was 40, but like the young woman before she gave birth to him. After that, leaving the maternity ward without a child, she had rapidly transformed into an old woman. And now she couldn't even touch him or say a word. But at least being in the same room, breathing the same air, and looking at her son made her happy. They hired Ilaria for the job. She got the chance to see the most precious person in her life. Yes, their conversations were limited to greetings, but for a mother, even that was enough. And if it wasn't enough, she could always position herself near the door of his office under the pretext of cleaning and listen to the sound of his familiar voice. Whether Pablo was conducting meetings or talking on the phone, she couldn't grasp the meaning of his words, but she didn't need to. She simply listened to his voice. She tried to work diligently, despite the fatigue, and she was happy about it. When she returned home, before falling asleep, she replayed every fleeting encounter and every word she heard, falling asleep with a happy smile. She thought about confessing to Pablo that she was his mother, but she hesitated. What kind of mother was she? She didn't even try to catch his eye. She was invisible, just like all the cleaning ladies. Who would pay attention to these women in gray overalls, perpetually bent over their buckets and mops? But sometimes, it seemed to Ilaria, Pablo did pay special attention to her. Perhaps that was true because after a week of her work, he stopped and not just greeted her, but also asked, How are you doing, Ilaria? Not too tired? Are you happy with the job? Thank you, Pablo. It's very satisfying, replied the elderly woman in a pleasantly surprised tone. I never get tired. On the contrary, the work gives me strength. The main thing is that everyone is happy with me. Everyone is satisfied with your work. The office is much cleaner and cozier with you around, mumbled the boss as he continued on his way, slightly puzzled about why he felt drawn to have a conversation with this not-so-young cleaning lady. Perhaps it was the warmth shining in her eyes whenever she looked at him? Grateful for hiring her? It seems like her life hasn't been too sweet. And she reminds me of mom, Pablo was the only and late child of his long-deceased parents. He had only learned that he was adopted after his father's death when he was already over 30. The news didn't make a huge impression on the grown man. After his father fell seriously ill, Pablo took over the management of his company. Forgive me, son, for not telling you earlier. Your father and I wanted to keep it a secret forever. We even went to another city to adopt you. There, my relative was in charge of the maternity ward and called us, saying that a young girl had decided to give up her child. So we went to get you. No one knew. We returned home with you after a month. We said that you were born in a good maternity ward there. What's the big deal, mom? You could have kept quiet, but knowing the truth doesn't change anything, right? Pablo responded. It's true, my dear. For me, at least. But what about you? You probably want to know who your biological parents were, right? Even we don't know. We never saw your mother and don't know her name. My relative said she was a young student. Oh, come on. I saw my mother then, and I see her now. Pablo kissed his mother's cheek. And why would I want to look for some other parents? Just think about it. We're not strangers to each other. We're the closest family, right? Or do you want to give me back? Oh, you. You're saying that too. 
but if I saw that girl, I'd bow down at her feet. She gave birth to such a wonderful boy. Come on, mom. That girl is probably a grandmother by now. She finished her studies, got married, had other children, all planned, and probably doesn't remember me. And I only remember you, and I don't think who gave birth to me matters. Thank you, my dear. Your father and I are so lucky, his mother wiped her tears. No, I'm the lucky one. I didn't grow up in an orphanage or a student dormitory. I grew up with you, the best parents. Pablo's childhood was genuinely happy. His parents did everything necessary and much more for him. He received an excellent upbringing and education. He never felt unhappy or abandoned. He was always loved, surrounded by care, and he truly loved his parents. But after his adoptive mother's confession, thoughts about his biological parents would occasionally resurface. Sometimes in the morning or evening, Pablo would pause in front of the mirror, looking at his reflection, and wonder, who am I? Who were my parents and my more distant ancestors? Will I ever find out their names or my own surname? It's probably not right. For a long time, the idea of finding out about his roots didn't come to his mind. Only after the death of his adoptive mother, when Pablo was already married and a father himself, did he start thinking that he could try to find his biological family. Perhaps he had parents and even siblings. But how would he find out? He never asked his mother in which maternity ward he was born. There were so many of them. He even shared his doubts with his wife, but she didn't fully understand. I think, my dear, you're unnecessarily dramatizing this. So what if we're not of noble blood? I know my parents, but I don't remember my grandparents or their names. They died before I was born, and what's the big deal? I'm still the same person, not remembering any relatives, and I don't see any problem with that. Your biological mother, well, clearly, she was just a regular provincial girl. She came to study, and instead, she got pregnant. You know, if I found out something like that about myself, I wouldn't even think about looking for a woman capable of such a thing. Pablo was reassured and accepted the situation, although thoughts of his unknown biological family would occasionally resurface. He still loved his adoptive mother and couldn't say which mother he thought about when looking at the elderly cleaning lady with such a warm light in her eyes, the one he remembered or the biological one. With each passing day, Ilaria Santis enjoyed being near her son even more, though unrecognized, nearly invisible, and unnoticed by him. Of course, this joy was accompanied by a considerable amount of bitterness. Yes, she had found her son, but he would never know she was his mother. She wouldn't get to see her daughter-in-law, grandchildren, and she knew that one day she would have to leave the job. Already, her hands and back were aching. When she left, her son would forget about her on the same day. Maybe I should write him a letter confessing and asking for forgiveness. Not now, after I leave the job. Then, let him decide for himself. But she couldn't do anything for her son. What would be left after her? Meager savings, a rundown house in the village, a photograph of Pablo's unfamiliar and unwanted relatives? What a wasted life I've had. But perhaps it was for the best that I gave up my son. Otherwise, what would he have become? The child of a poor cleaning lady. She knew it wasn't entirely true, but... However, there was one day when she got the chance to do something very significant for her son. On that day, Ilaria Santis, as usual, quietly moved through the corridors, mopping floors, dusting, and almost involuntarily, she found herself near Pablo's office. There was an important meeting going on inside. The elderly woman had no idea about her son's business and didn't understand anything about it, but she felt something ominous. No, the imposing men, all in suits and ties, were behaving as usual, sternly but seemingly friendly to one another. Ilaria had always liked their manner of interacting, shaking hands and smiling politely when they met, being courteous and considerate during negotiations. It was the same on that day, but something about it felt threatening. Oh, something isn't right here, but what can I do about it? All right, I'll do what I can. I'll listen to what they say. The negotiations were not over but had been interrupted. 
The men got up from the table, scattered around the office, whispering to each other. Ilaria Santis picked up her broom with a cloth and sneaked into the corner where the most suspicious man was situated. Before approaching him, she secretly turned on the voice recorder on her phone, which was in her robe's pocket. Getting as close as possible to the man talking, she pretended not to pay attention to him and tried not to draw any attention to herself, as if she were just emptying the trash bin. What she heard from the man horrified Ilaria, but how could she warn Pablo of the danger? He was still in his office, reviewing some papers. Pablo knew that the contract he was about to sign was properly drawn up and mutually beneficial, but there was something about the partners that made him wary. But you can't reject the long-discussed project just because it feels suspicious. If you can't articulate your concerns, don't confuse people. It seems clear here. Yes, I'll have to sign it without further doubts. No need to offend people with mistrust. The negotiators gathered in the office again. The crucial moment was approaching. Pablo placed the contract in front of him, took out a pen, and suddenly, out of nowhere, cleaning Lady Ilaria appeared behind his shoulder. Pablo, she said in a pleading whisper, don't you dare sign it. I beg you. I have evidence. What's wrong with you, Ilaria? Pablo asked sternly. What are you even doing here? Yeah, you must have hired staff straight out of the madhouse. This post-retirement age madam is just lurking around all day, and now she's giving advice to you, the company owner, said the partner with mocking anger. I told you, this is a disastrous contract. Ilaria Santis exclaimed. Seeing that nobody was taking her word seriously, she took a cup of coffee and spilled it over the documents. What on earth is this? Pablo shouted. The other men jumped to their feet. Someone politely but firmly grabbed the cleaning lady's elbow, probably trying to take her phone away. The voice recorder. Turn on the voice recorder, son. Ilaria cried, handing her phone to Pablo. Why did she call him son for the first time at that moment? Did he even notice it? After all, many elderly women address young people that way. Pablo turned on the voice recorder. From it, the voice of the partner came through, speaking on the phone. Hello. Yes, it's me. Yes, the deal is almost sealed. Now this fool will sign it, but first, I need to hear how much I'll get for this. Only that much? No, please double the amount. No. Sorry, but it wasn't easy to gain his trust. Okay then, it will all be cancelled. Now that's different. I hear the voice of a savvy businessman. Yes, now you can be sure everything will go smoothly. Pablo put the phone on the table and looked at his partner. The latter smirked crookedly, well, I lost. And because of whom? Because of a cleaning lady? Where did you find her, an old rat? And you, fool, why are you staring? I was more loyal to your parents, loyal as no dog could be. And what did I gain from it? Nothing. You inherited everything rightfully. Well, choke on it now, golden boy. All the best to you. And to you, old lady, may you have many more years and a dry grave. He left in absolute silence, and suddenly, Ilaria Santis felt such a relief and, at the same time, such a tightness in her chest that she quietly collapsed unconscious onto the floor. She woke up in a hospital ward and clearly not in some shabby hospital. The ward was private, with good renovation, equipment, and, most importantly, a large beautiful bouquet of flowers stood on the nightstand. Who else could care for her, a homeless cleaning lady, in such a way? Only he, Pablo, who didn't even know that she was his mother. What a kind and noble person he was. And she was good too, she saved her son from not only death, but also from serious trouble. Now, even dying wouldn't be regrettable. And the fact that Pablo wouldn't know who she was didn't matter either. As she enjoyed such thoughts, Pablo himself entered the ward. Hello, Ilaria. How are you feeling? Are you feeling better? Much better. Thank you for the flowers, and for everything, Pablo. What happened to me? Heart attack. But I spoke to the doctor, everything will be fine. 
Thank you too. You saved me. But I'd like to ask you a question if you don't mind. Absolutely any. Today, you address me formally again, using my first name and patronymic, but yesterday, I was son. This question revealed confusion, but Ilaria decided not to be embarrassed anymore. Well, how can I put it? The story is long and not pleasant, to be honest. Although, if we look at it, it's straightforward and short. You are indeed my son. Yes, I left you at the maternity ward. I couldn't take you, didn't want to, was afraid, betrayed. And, of course, I was punished by God or life, or maybe by myself. I don't know, but that's how it turned out. Ilaria talked about her youth, about her first and last, absurd love, about betrayal and her subsequent life. Pablo, after listening to the story, remained silent for a long time, seemingly trying to grasp what had happened. Tears welled up in his eyes. Yes, it was difficult to digest. And what about my father? What happened to him? He finally asked. I don't know. I think something even worse. He didn't become a famous actor or anything like that, apparently. Probably, he got expelled too. And all those bohemian indulgences didn't lead to anything good. I haven't seen him since then, except about ten years ago in the city. I decided to go to the church and saw him there, begging, down and out. I wouldn't have recognized him. Just his eyes. And he didn't recognize me either. I gave him something, heard some God bless you, and went on my way. That's how it went, Pablo. And I came up with your name. It's in honor of my grandfather, Pablo, a war hero. I loved him very much. Fortunately, your parents kept your names, otherwise, how would I have found you? Thank your mother and father for raising you so well. Ilaria Santis was tired of this difficult conversation and reclined on the pillow. Pablo, too, was perplexed and subdued. All right, Ilaria. You need to rest, and I need to process all this. You understand, it's not easy to accept such news. I have paid for your stay here, all the medicines. So, I think everything will be all right. And I will visit you again, more than once. Don't doubt it. Pablo left, and Ilaria lay there, smiling. How well everything turned out. She helped her son as much as she could, and she told him everything. Would he forgive her betrayal? Would they meet again? It didn't matter to her anymore. She was utterly happy. Pablo came the next day. After exchanging greetings, he immediately approached her, hugged her, and kissed her like a real son. I spoke with the doctor. He said you can continue recovering at home, mom. Yes, mom, you will come with me to my place, and you will live there from now on. Our talk about the most important thing took only ten minutes. That's not much, you'd agree. I still want to learn a lot about my real family and tell you about myself. And it's about time you meet your grandchildren too. They're all grown up. I'm not taking you in as a nanny, don't worry. So, you've forgiven me, my boy? Wiping her tears, Ilaria asked, do I have the right to judge you? I have nothing to forgive you for, Mom. It's just time for us to become one family, that's all. Will your family really accept me? I don't particularly need anything, you know. I have a home and money. So, if you're doing this out of pity, don't talk nonsense, Mom. If you want to live separately, it's your choice, but right now, my family is eagerly waiting for you, my wife and kids. What happiness, whispered Ilaria. She was indeed welcomed very warmly. Somehow, she easily felt like a part of this big, friendly family, the kind she had always dreamt of. We did have a family, just three people in total, my parents and me. Then I left and abandoned my elderly parents. Although we were like a family in our private sector. You know what? Let's all go there together sometime and I have a Christmas tree growing on my plot for New Year's. We can decorate it. That's awesome. The grandchildren, two teenage boys, exclaimed excitedly. And so they did. 
Those Christmas holidays in the private sector became a true acquaintance for Pablo with his family's history, something he had been eager to know. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.